Can I try that again? That, that power is good, you're right. Those of you who have been involved in organizational transformation or leadership team development will know to expect the unexpected. You wake up in the morning, you get an email, you go, bugger, no one told me there was going to be a day like this today, right? And the whole world changes. But also notice I'm here by myself. And I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to have Alan, Brian, and Ian on the Sam Dawes leadership team to be joining me. And they're currently um, having breakfast in Chiang Mai in Thailand for a meeting that was called relatively recently. So they're not here. But then again, the unexpected happens. What we did, though, was sit down with them last week and ask them all the questions that we're going to ask them today in terms of helping them tell us their story over the last 12 months. As Roma said, uh, we often catch up in Bill's coffee shop, and I find six months after we've had a conversation, I end up in a stage like this with Roma telling something that emerged a few months earlier. But in that conversation, we were talking about having been at many conferences over the years and hearing some really interesting and inspiring studies and stories of organizations transforming. And they were really interesting, but for me as a practitioner, they often felt perfect. They often felt like they were wrapped up in a box with a big, beautiful red bow and here's what's happened. And I'm sat there thinking, I don't actually know what happened in the first meeting. What did the leader say that actually started this conversation? And who dropped out along the way and why was that? And when the first metal hurdle came along, why did you choose that avenue versus this avenue? And when you said you transformed yourself, like, from what to what? Like, what was that about? And so for me, this is a story about that, the warmth and all, the story as it's unfurling. Bono is a fellow from Dublin you might have heard of. He's a really great executive coach. He does a lot of coaching with people. But one of his comments is, if you want to understand me, know my memories. If you want to understand someone, learn their memories. And this is a collection of memories over the last 12 months. Almost like act one of a three-act play. Year one of a three-year turnaround story. And acts two and acts three haven't been written yet. Because they've just started, so we don't know what it is. So sand laws are a generic, ethical, pharmaceutical business. What that means is they make high-quality prescription drugs. So when you go into a chemist and a pharmacist offer you a generic version of the prescription you've got, the chances are that sand laws will be one of the products that you get. They're 125 years old, originated in Basel in Switzerland, and are now part of the Novartis Group. And our story starts with Alan Tiller when he joined Sandoz Australia New Zealand in January of 2014. When I first joined Sandoz, we had a lot of high caliber people within the business. But very much this was a team of champions as opposed to a champion team. It, the business was chaotic. Um, I had joined at the end of 2012 and prior to Alan I had six different managers in the business. We had six different managers pulling us in six different ways um, and it was pretty much a nightmare. Um, individual teams were doing, were doing okay but in terms of the direction of the business and the, and the way that we were working it was, it was really, really tough. We had a lot of turnover. I think we had around 24% turnover at the end of 2013. Um, so coming into the business there was a lot of turnover, there was a lot of unhappy people um, not knowing what their roles and responsibilities were um, and we had a new leadership team in place. So it was very much um, an uncertain place to be um, and, and I guess people were looking to Alan and the leadership team for direction. And it was very clear to me that from a leadership perspective, there was a gap. There was a very, very clear gap. So a lot of talented people, but not working together and not working as a cohesive team together. Now, not working together as a team. I think that team word, at best, is a euphemism for where they were. In reality, they were a working group. And if you look at the earlier framework we saw, operating between chaos and complexity every single day. So the word team actually is, is where they wanted to be, but had no sense of how to do that. And we helped them run an initial meeting in a small hotel in Barrow. Barrow is, is south of Sydney. And in hindsight, that meeting didn't work well at all. At best, it started the conversation. At best, it suggested that leadership is on the agenda, and leadership was going to become the agenda. But that's really it. It didn't get too far. When I look at the early part of 2014, we had a, an initial leadership off-site meeting in Barrel at the end of Q1. It was a really important meeting. 
The output of the meeting was probably not as significant as it might have been, but it was a very, very important step forward in terms of communicating to the team that leadership was on the agenda. And the way that we behaved as a leadership team was very much on the agenda. I think at the beginning of the meeting, uh, we really didn't know how to, how to approach each other as individuals. Um, I don't think we had a lot of uh, respect for each other. We just didn't really know how to, how to play. We could all be department leaders and we could all understand how to manage our teams and foster them uh, effectively, but we really didn't have a, have a clue how to, to, to work with each other. Uh, and so I guess for me, it was pretty confronting. Um, we needed to, to open up and we needed to start to work together with a group of people who had no idea how to do that. What we did do, though, was take a baseline. We asked them to assist themselves in terms of working together. And so this is the Leadership Circle Culture Survey. And some of the people on that team have been together for a number of years. Some had joined over the previous year, and some had joined the previous few months. But those of you who are familiar with this tool will know that's not a good picture. Right? That doesn't feel good. Right? Yeah, high in complying, very high in protecting, and really, I think they undercalled how high they were in controlling because they were high in complying. Right? But it felt like a group that were hyper polite, hyper nice in the conversation, and at break time, suddenly the conversations happened in the corridors. It felt like a group that were using their intellectual prowess to have barbs at each other. And let me make a comment about why you're so stupid. I won't use those words. I won't talk to you like an idiot. But my guess what? I think of you like one. And that, that came through a lot. So it, it felt mucky. And I remember saying to him at one stage in this meeting, I feel like I'm stuck in mud. I feel like I'm being dragged back down and nothing's moving. And nothing moved in that meeting. But it was a starting point. Now, in all of our work that we do with new managing directors, new CEOs, we get them to a clear relevant area on what is their paint the lobby project. Now a paint the lobby project comes from a notion from the US private hospital system. And anybody who's ever been into a private hospital in the US will know it looks and feels like a five star hotel. And it's designed for that because the clientele are high net worth individuals, high net worth families, and they're attracting that kind of person into the hospital. So it's going to look like a place they would normally go to, i.e. a five star hotel. And when a new CEO joins that kind of hospital, one of the first things they do is paint the lobby. It's a sign of someone new has started, it's a signal of someone's going to change. So we worked with Alan pretty quickly to go, what will be your first paint the lobby project to signal both to your team and to the organization things are about to change? Here's what he did. During the middle of 2014, at one of our town hall meetings, I announced that we were going to have a stop it month. And the purpose of the stop it month was actually to communicate to the business that it was okay to stop doing things if they weren't making sense to the business. It's a reality that things that we've been doing for years and years and years make sense when we first do them. And there's probably a very, very tangible and rational reason for why we do them. But 10 years later, does it still make sense that we do things the way we've always done them? I think the main output of that, other than people challenging some of the processes and some of the work that they were actually doing, was a very clear signal to the business that assess what you're doing. We don't have to do what we've always done. And I want you to think about the business. I want you to think about what you're doing. And is it contributing to the results that we're, we're all striving for? And what was interesting about that is, when the leadership team realized he had just announced the whole organization, by the way, that we're doing this, some of them started thinking, how are we going to measure this? Is it in how many hours we save per month? Is it 20 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours? You know, well, how are we going to measure quality? What's the impact on the customer? Alan's point of view is, we need to take the first step. So the close in. What's the first step? The first step is get people thinking, we're going to think differently. So we don't have to do what we've always done. In the administration side of the business, they actually started, um, they stopped doing documents they had always done. They stopped duplicating things. The receptionists stopped repeating stuff that other parts of the business were doing. And they started acting differently. The head, the people in marketing started and stopped doing some of the duplications that they were doing. And he walked into the business around June or July and asked staff, what, what, what was that stop at month like? They go, great. I can now, I've got permission to do something differently. 
So a first step didn't require a massive change, but it started people thinking. Now, some of you will be very familiar with this framework, the leadership system. It's an, a very useful overarching framework for organizations and for coaches to get clear on. If I'm going to help an organization or a leadership team to shift, what is the range of options open? How can I help them in different ways? Because working one-on-one -on -one is a very slow process. It's a very slow process. So how do you accelerate that? And the leadership system is a guideline to look at the range of events or interventions or dialogues that you can have with an organization over a 12-month or 24-month period that systemically builds upon each other and allows the organization to shift. So we sat down with Alan and Brian and helped them map out what a 24-month program might look like for their organization, using many of the elements that you see here. And Alan was crystal clear for him, a one-off event was not going to be the solution. It had to be more than just that. I wanted to take a systemic and long-term approach to developing the leadership team. This was really, really important to me because as many people have experienced, you go on courses, you do some fantastic development programs, but typically the folder remains on the shelf and gathers dust over time. So a one-off event was not going to uh, drive the change that we needed to make if we were going to lead this business and make it a very successful business. Go out then. Now, for some of his team who have been in the organization for a number of years, they were skeptical. We have started this before, we've had this meeting before, we've been down this path before, we've been to venues like Viral before, and we're still here. And they needed to see evidence from him that actually, yes, you are serious. You plan to do more than just one meeting. You need to show by example what you're doing. But the reality is getting started is very, very difficult. And taking the first step is very difficult. And for a leader with a new leader team, if you've ever read The First 90 Days by Michael Watkins, which is a really useful book, you learn very quickly, you need to have your team in place in the first 90 days, according to that philosophy. If you're working in a multinational organization where you have a matrix structure and you have hard lines and dotted lines, it's actually very difficult sometimes to move on your ideas. You might decide in your first 90 days who my team is, but actually getting that into place can take a while. And it took him two months, sorry, two quarters. So by the end of June, he was now ready with the team he wanted. And the reality is nothing happened in the first two quarters until the right team are in the right place. Once he had the people in place and the people he didn't want had left, he also restructured the team. So the head of finance was given commercial responsibility for New Zealand as well as head of finance. So a step up in his responsibilities. Um, Nalan, who was head of business development, also took on a broader responsibility across the market development and regular affairs, a step up in her competency. So getting started was the hardest part. But what Alan did quite bravely was, if I we want to do this, let's start with me. So let's start with my 360. In month seven, I've been in the role. So we did his 360 for the whole team. The whole team rated him using the leadership circle profile. Then we did 360 for the rest of the team using the leadership circle profile. And then we ran an exercise called Now What? And Now What is a, a reflective process. So after you've done your 360, you go, now what? What's next? And we guide them through a simple piece on, you've done your 360, what are your initial observations of what you've been told? What are your initial learnings from the 360 that you've been told? What are the initial questions you have that you don't understand why people are saying what they're saying about what you've been told? And what are your initial first steps? And get them into that frame of mind of learning, inquiring, and starting to move, but not worrying about what transformation looks like, just the first pieces. And then we brought them back down to Barrel, but this time to a different hotel, to a different room, a much bigger room, with lots of light, to allow for a different kind of conversation to take place. And they, they now call that Barrel 2. At our second off-site leadership meeting, which was held in Barrel towards the latter part of last year, I thought the meeting was a very, very powerful meeting. First and foremost, I had the leadership team that I wanted in place. I think that was a really important development. And I expressed to each of the members of the team uh, how important they were to the team and, frankly, how pleased I was that they were on my team. I think that was really a breakthrough for the team, if I'm honest. Um, I think we'd had a previous offsite, two previous offsites before um, that were very awkward, people weren't communicating effectively. Um, and I think the barrel one was really opening everyone's eyes to each other's feedback. We uh, went through the formal process of the leadership circle 
and we had a particularly compelling session where we were all standing on the leadership circle mat. And what was particularly interesting out of that meeting, or out of that exercise, was the fact that the team got a, a very clear appreciation in terms of the way they were perceived by their teams uh, and by their peers. Uh, it's very confronting, very, very confronting, but it's usually those things that are most confronting that are most beneficial. I'm a visual person and the mat was a, a fantastic experience. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a massive surface which we're, we're standing on uh, and the physical separation of each of the people into the zones where, where, where their strengths were and where their weaknesses were was just fascinating. So, so we could start to really see as a group of individuals who was common with us and start to appreciate who had massive different approaches and, and how we could bridge the gaps, understanding how if you moved around the mat, you could actually bridge, bridge the various gaps. Um, so one of my peers and I um, had very similar profile when we completed the um, 360 feedback. Um, and part of that um, profile was that we had very high self-awareness, but we rated low from our peers in terms of achievement. Um, and both myself and Colin, um, who's the head of legal, were really quite upset with that rating and we were really surprised that we had that feedback. So I think when we stood in that square or in that, that area, um, I think the team was quite honest with us and said it's because we're not as visible as we could be. We don't communicate what we do day to day. But then they were very quick to jump in and say we do actually contribute a lot to the business. Um, so it was a real breakthrough moment for us because we were a little bit shell-shocked by the feedback in the survey. But until we heard it from them that we're not very strong on communicating what we do day to day, we then started to understand where the team was coming from um, and had that feedback from our peer group. Now there's no doubt if you're looking at a series of memories that conversation on a mat like this was a breakthrough for them. Um, you heard Bronnie talking about how she felt so upset standing over in the achievement part of it and saying, how come none of you see what I'm doing? I'm working really hard, but none of you see that. And you can hear in her voice how, how upset she was. Her colleague, Colin, was the person who, who prompted her going, I am dumbfounded that none of you, my peers, can see how hard I work and the output that I think I'm giving, none of you see that. And there's no doubt that that conversation was a moment that mattered. So academics who, who specialize in complexity talk about a thing called strange attractors and point attractors. And this natural phenomena that emerges in a group, in a conversation, and people latch onto it. It could be a word, it could be a phrase, it could be an image, it could be a story, but the group seems to, to gather around it and use that to make sense of something else. And I think our role as coaches supporting them is to grab that moment that mattered and, help, and continue to help them make sense of that then and in the future. This conversation, I've seen it run quite a few times with teams, and it takes about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. These guys spent over three and a half hours on the mat and didn't move. It was the first time they had a wide and deep conversation, and the first time they started being honest in, in reality. So to give, give you some examples of some of the conversations. I've already talked about Bryony and Colin. Uh, one of their other colleagues is extraordinarily skilled and extraordinarily gifted at being autocratic. <laughs> By far the most skilled in that group, and one of the most skilled I've ever met. And we've heard this morning about the unbearable rightness of being. Well, they had said to him, you are so unbearable when you believe you are right. But instead of having a, a debate, one of them literally said, could you walk over here with me? And now let's have the conversation about how you react in these meetings from this space. And they guided the conversation with that. Now, what I have to say is, the mass we had in the second meeting was a big soccer. It was huge. It was about 20 or 30 meters. Now, I have no idea, Dale, whether size matters. You told me yesterday size matters. In the case of a big mat, a big conversation can take place. And that's what happened here. So our role supporting them after that day was to remind them, you know, a moment that mattered happened on that mat. Relative to the issue you're having today in this conversation, Go back to that conversation and the wisdom or the consciousness that arose from that. How would you apply that back to where you are today and regularly remind them of their consciousness and their competence they're trying to build that they un uncovered on that actual session? 
And that was a big, heavy session over three or four hours. We then had lunch, and we came back and said, let's run a fast, furious, frenetic, different type of energy. So we ran a speed dating session with them. And everybody had six minutes with their profile that they already had and their reflection, now what, process they already done before they came here to meet with all of the peers over six minutes, fast and fiercely going, here's me, here's what I look like. And the peer to go, well, given that, here's a tip for you. Here's an idea for you. So no more feedback, here's, here's something for you to focus on. And the energy and the conversation just spiraled upwards. And for that, for them, that was also a breakthrough. So they came back into the same room a few hours later and go, individually, here's what I'm committing to. Here's my one big thing that I'm now committing to as a peer based upon my 360, based upon the now what reflection I've already done, based upon the feedback on the mat, and based upon this speed editing process we've just had. Here's what I'm committing to. Second of all, they also committed to we as a group. Here's the four things that we want to commit to collectively. They, they went back to the organization later in December and again in January to tell the whole organization what they were. But they decided, let us get this right for the next couple of months. Let's focus on these four things together and then we'll tell the organization what we're doing so they can actually monitor for us. So individual commitments and group commitments. So one of the of key outputs out of this meeting was that we came up with four key commitments to the business as to how we as a leadership team were going to lead this organization. And that was a, a very, very important step forward. As a collective, I don't think this had been done before with the leadership team. So again, I go back to the fact that we had very talented individuals, but as a collective leadership team, we didn't have a coherent way that we were going to operate as a team. Even more to the point, we certainly hadn't communicated that to the broader business. So we then made the announcement to the business at a town hall late last year that these were the four tenants that we were going to sign up to. So as a team, we committed to lead the organisation. Um, so we wanted to set a clear vision. Um, one of the key um, commitments was we wanted to stop crushing the idea before we had the debate. Um, that's very much what Sandos did in the past. We've done things a certain way. We don't need to change. And I think that's where, what was holding us back. Um, so we've committed to, to stop crushing the idea before we have the debate. Um, we also wanted to recognise um, and build a winning culture. Um, in the past, when we've had successes, we've just ticked the box and moved on, and we haven't taken the time to celebrate the great work people are doing. For me, the, my individual commitments were, I needed to stop stifling the debate. Um, you know, I'm a, I'll call myself a realist, but I'm, I'm also seen as, as quite a cynic. And so I needed to um, commit to my team that I needed to you know, let the debates run and not always you know, divert into a cynic mode or into a, into a sort of a disruptive mode. Um, so that, to me, was, was very important. For myself, one of the key personal commitments was to raise my own visibility, um, for the team to understand who I was, what, what my values were, um, and just to be more visible out in the team. Um, the previous year, I spent a lot of time doing clean-up HR, basic HR, um, and not enough on the strategy. So this year, based on those personal commitments, I've really turned that around um, and been very focused on strategy. I've moved out of my HR office to be open plan. Um, so I've done several things based on that commitment. Um, and I think until you write it down and you commit to it, you're not very good at following through. So it was also great to see my peers committing to things that I'd wanted them to commit to for a year now. Um, so I think the fact that we're sticking to those commitments has been really changing, a changing mode for the team. So for, for us working with Sandals over the next couple of months, our job is to work with each of the individual leaders one-on-one uh, -on -one and to help them focus on their individual commitment that they had made and on the group commitment that they had made and then whatever else just naturally arose throughout their day-by-day -day leadership and the day-by-day -day, um, focus. And if I look back on what we did, um, using, say, Isaac's framework about dialogue, really what we're trying to do is help them learn some new skills and some new uh, frameworks and some new ideas to move their natural conversation from a defensive one into more of a skilled one and hopefully have a dialectic conversation to move from being defensive to maybe generative at times, to figure out new ways of doing stuff, and to regularly help them reflect on those conversations and those ways of thinking and those operating systems that were either enabling or inhibiting you know, their own consciousness. And of course, the way you do that is help them to naturally understand their biases and therefore how they can suspend that to allow for questions, to allow for 
deep listening or sometimes even just basic listening. Yeah? Not let my sarcasm get in the way. I'm actually hearing what you actually say. One of them said to us one day, it feels like you guys are helping us tilt our sails to the wind as the winds keep coming. Right? You're just gently guarding us as the winds are coming our way. And we are still sailing our own boat, but you're just shepherding that. And I think a really simple example was you know, one stage, a subset of the team had to get together to develop a new strategy for one of the commercial businesses. And one of our teams stepped in and go, let me help you facilitate it so it allows you to play safe and to allow for conversations. And I will provide that crucible and help you guys do it. So both a learning, a skilling, and a generative type piece. From our end, you know, the team and our business working together, we have to regularly regroup and go, so what are you noticing? What are you seeing? Who's progressing? Where are the conversations? What's emerging? What's falling aside? And by no means to judge, just to kind of go, let's just watch. So then we need to tilt what we do. We need to shape what we do. And sometimes that means we need to accelerate the way we work with one particular person, or maybe just step back. But again, just keep watching. Because there's no doubt when you're inside a system, you're like a goldfish boat in a bowl. You cannot see what's happening all around you. When you're stepping outside the system, which is part of our role, we can see what's going on if we keep actively, actively and accurately observing that. Now, we heard this morning about complexity. Sometimes you don't know until after the event what's actually happened, and then you get a chance to make sense of that. Well, last week, we took the whole team through a, about a four-hour exercise called a narrative timeline, where we got them to, first of all, map out the last 12 months and all the major events and all the major things that have happened along that timeline. And then to come back and go, what were the stories your staff were saying or talking about along that timeline? So you can capture some of those nuances. And then go again, what were your stakeholders saying at the time about you and about the change you were making? And capture that piece. And then a different color pen, what were you not saying? You the leaders along that timeline. And a lot of learning happens in hindsight, and a lot of sense-making happens when you get that visual depiction of a potential journey. And of course, it's still two or three-dimensional at best. But a few things came out of that. One is, with complexity and with organizations, you have to expect the unexpected. Sometimes the unexpected is negative, but sometimes it's positive. And here's a video of Ian talking yeah, Later in this year, we're moving, moving offices, and, and one of the the things with the, the office move is we're changing our work style from offices and cubicles to activity-based working. Um, and activity-based working is a, is a way for, um, for individuals to work in the type of environment which they need for that particular moment in time. So they might need a quiet focus area or they might need a collaboration area. Um, and what I decided to do within my team was I've got a big enough team and I decided that I'd pilot it first. And so as a group of individuals, we all got together and decided that we could do activity-based working, and then we just kicked it off. Individuals used to come up and say to me, oh, do you mind if I disturb you? Uh, but now if I'm sitting in an interactive zone, they can sit next to me all day, and of course they can disturb me because I'm in an interactive zone. We've got uh, more casual areas where we can sit together. We've got collaboration zones, and we we'll watch teams sit together and have meetings, which used to be more formal, but now are just people working together all day and collaborating as they need. And so it's, it's quite a change to the organisation and, and the mindset. And what they realised last week was over half of the organisation has just done it. No one asked anyone to do it, no one prompted anyone to do it, but they've just done it. And the leaders have all left their offices and now sit on the floor, and those offices become meeting rooms. So again, a positive, unexpected event that starts with how do we collaborate better together and then see what happens. It. So they started noticing changes. And I suppose one of our role when you're working with leaders is to help them notice changes, help them to watch what's happening. And we started in our group noticing changes around November, December, January in terms of the quality of connection, the quality of competence seems to be rising. And there seemed to be a lot more dialogue at a deeper level that was happening. Again, I'm going to go back to Ian, but Ian tells a story of sitting on a boat in the pouring rain and him realizing this is the first time we've ever had this kind of conversation. Yeah, our January conference was really, uh, really important. Um, change for the organization. What we, what we were able to do is uh, start to see the leaders integrating within the rest of the organization. And, and a great example was a, was a boat trip where we, 
we uh, took out to, to one of the nice islands. Um, you know, it was bucketing down, it was pouring, it was miserable and windy, and, and what was absolutely fascinating was the, the fact that the, there was a group of, of the leadership team, and, and I think it was four of us were sitting out in the back of the boat, um, and there were four or five uh, of, our, of our team sitting with us. Um, and they gave us the perspective that, you know, they'd never been in an organisation where they had access to the leaders so readily. And we're sitting out there in the rain and the wind and we're just chatting and they're asking all the, the questions which they've never been able to ask in other organisations. Again, another moment that mattered in getting the leaders to start recognising these and, and keep building upon these. And there's something about that idea of sitting on a boat and a pouring rain and what's coming around the corner. Let's see what happens there. But I noticed on the slide this morning it says that this is the fifth conference on leader development and business performance. So we've been talking about leader development the last few minutes. How about the business performance? Because this is all ultimately about how's the business going. I'm delighted to say at the end of last year they absolutely nailed it. We're a very financially driven organization and we're judged by our financial metrics. We have five KPIs and these are held sacred by the organization and ultimately the performance of any business is judged by these KPIs. The really pleasing result was that we closed out 2014 with a, uh, having achieved all of our five KPIs and having a green light against each of those. An achievement on all five financial KPIs has not happened for many, many years. Within the region that we participate and uh, are involved in, which is the Asia Pacific region, we were judged the highest performing business within that region, which was great testimony to the advance, uh, the advances that we had made as a team and as a business. So it was a very, very pleasing result. Now, I would love, I would love if this was my last slide and I'd be walking out, you're all standing up and you're cheering and you go, well done. And we, we, we have Queen playing, we are the champions in the background. And we've got everybody from the organization going, what's his phone number? We need him inside here and his group. But the reality is, after Q4 of 2014 comes Q1 2015. And the word that sums up Q1 for this group is bugger. Bugger, bugger, bugger. That was a great time we had last year. But you know what? This year is very different. So as we closed out 2014 with an absolutely stellar performance, we entered into 2015 with some challenges. And it's really interesting. Uh, I think it was Greg Chappell who said, you're only as good as your last innings. And that's true for our business as well. Um, I think the first quarter of this year was busier than we could have ever expected. Um, I think we spent a lot of time talking to region and global about our targets for the year ahead. Um, and we forgot to focus internally. Um, we were focusing outward, I guess, to region and global. Um, so we lost our way a little bit. We lost our momentum. When I look at the beginning of the year and the challenges that we faced in January, particularly on supply, I th actually think that we took a step back as a team and there was a tendency towards battening down the hatches and taking a silo approach to our own areas of responsibility. So we started the year uh, with quite some strain and frankly, some very tense moments within, uh, within the business. And there's no, there's no doubt they step back. There's no doubt when you're feeling overwhelmed, don't know what to do, you go back to what you know best. You step back to the reactive sides of your profile, to your natural identity, to what you've done before. And there's no doubt we started noticing the conversations were returning to the ones we, we had met a year earlier. And you're looking for a moment that matters. You're looking for someone to step up and go, hey guys, as are my peers, we need to do something different. And in this case, Bryony, head of HR recognized that, do you know what's missing? We are not very resilient. We are not good as a leadership team, but as an organization, we are not good. So therefore, how do we develop this as a platform to underpin everything else that we're talking about? Um, and I still hear from the, the field force and from the head office team, um, when things get tough, they, they get very stressed out um, and they worry that you know, we're going to go off course and everything's going to fall over again like it was in 2013. Um, so I really felt we needed to talk a little bit about, about resilience. Um, and in a generics environment or in any marketplace in Australia, things can get tough, but it's about, you know, sticking to your guns and actually achieving your results. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about resilience at our conference. And if I'm perfectly honest, I had my doubts as to what the benefit was going to be of this training. 
what astounded me was the enthusiasm and the engagement of everybody within the business to this particular training event. The topic, as it turned out, couldn't have been more appropriate and couldn't have been better targeted for where we're at. We operate in the prescription generic pharmaceuticals market. It is a very tough market. It is a very highly contested and intensely competitive marketplace. So each and every day we earn the right to compete, we earn the right to exist. Resilience is at the core of us being successful. And it was great to have this out in the open and to discuss how can we be as individuals, as teams and as an organisation far more resilient. So we found then working with them, we had to step back and go, let's go back to basics, let's go back to the individual commitment each of you have made. Let's go back to the group commitment each of you have made. And how do we help you build some resilience tools for yourself and as a team to make sure you're able to take that first and second and third step. And let's not worry about Q4, Q5 and whatever else. Let's just get ready for now. Because ultimately, when we talk about change, the change always starts with me. Embarking on a leadership program like this can be a very exciting and ambitious project. But the reality is it's a lot of hard work. And I do think that there is great benefit in having an external party that can actually act as a litmus test for you as you go along the, uh, the program. Particularly as the leader who's trying to uh, drive the evolution of the leadership team. I think it's great to have a external source that you can use as a sounding board and to help you uh, take stock as the, progress, as the process evolves that you are actually indeed on the right track and to keep perspective when things are not going quite so well. I think when you do the, um, the 360 feedback, it can be very confronting. Um, and I think make sure that you do have that one-on-one -on -one support with somebody um, that's driving the program or leading the program. Because I think if people were left alone after that 360 feedback, it may not have had the same positive outcome because it's quite confronting um, to get direct feedback about yourself and your peers. Um, so you need to not do half of it and then finish. You need to follow the whole process to get the right outcomes. Um, so personally for me, it's been fantastic to have that support um, and just think, think of things in a different way um, than what you may do um, normally. So as a group, you remember, they went to the organisation in December and in January to say to the organisation, here's the four things we're committing to. And uh, three times a year, we're going to come back to you, the organisation, and say, how are we going? How are we tracking? Tell us what we're doing well. Tell us what we're missing up. So despite all the complexity of the last quarter and quarter one, they still went back to the organisation and said, how are we tracking? Because ultimately that is the first step. How, how are we taking our first step? And so we shared this information with the group only last week. So the first commitment they made was to build a winning culture that we can all be proud of that addresses result areas, not just the financials. It's a broader piece. And on a seven-point scale, zero being no progress of any kind and seven being great progress, over half the organization is saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing you doing well. It's going well. It's, it's make, you're making sense. You're making progress. There's movement. We can see some tangible results. Cool. Second group, stop crushing the debate, i.e. allow ideas to generate. Again, over half the organization said, yeah, we're making progress. It's obvious. And there's some tangible results starting to come through it. Again, great. Nicely done. Third one, be more decisive with your senior leadership team, SLT decisions and share with us what's behind it. Not so great. So the feedback is, yeah, we see what you're doing, but you're not sharing with us what's behind or the rationale behind it. Now you could argue they were very, very busy. Either way, they promised to the organization, here's what we commit to, and the organization said, you know, you're, making, you're doing some stuff, but it's not good enough. Get better at that. And lastly, building the discipline to celebrate good performance. So it's not a one-off. This becomes a learned process for the whole organization. They're going, yes, we're actually doing that well. We are making progress with that. They also asked them, of the four commitments, you know, what are you noticing? You know, where are we going well? And some simple stuff like the town halls are every single fortnight, consistently, we're getting information. You made a commitment to us, you would do that. It's working really well. We love it. Transparency of leadership. You tell us what we're going to do or what you're going to do, and you're doing it. Great. A lot of positive around that. Um, a lot of communication. Even though they're not going as well as they thought, still going a lot better than you were a year ago. Where else should they focus? 
take your leadership ethos and cascade it on the organizations. It can't just be you. It has to be more than just you. So help the organization get better with the same ethos. Celebrate success more often because we are doing some good stuff. And yet it's tough, but let's just re remember we are doing well. So let's celebrate that more often. And lastly, uh, where else should we focus? This is what was interesting. If you're going to drive a high-performance culture, help manage out the poor performers. I'm working very hard, but we see people around here who are not. The leaders need to manage that and, and help deal with that. So we commit to this, but we need to see action around poor performance. Also some stuff around processes. Some of the processes are broken. They are slowing us down. Help those get fixed, and then you know, we can be more effective. So some useful information and a good pulse check in the middle of a turbulent time to say, yeah, you're making progress. You are committing to some stuff, but you've got a lot of work to go. There's, there's some more room there. So last week, when we shared all this feedback with the, the team, we, we asked them, now that you've been doing this for a year, what do you now know that you didn't know a year ago? So if you're considering embarking on a leadership development program such as we have here at Sandoz, I think you need to consider carefully whether you're in it for the long haul. Because as with many of these programs, the, the first part of the program is actually very satisfying, very exciting, and you get to see some great results early on. But the reality then hits, and that is that it's not easy to work as a high-performing team. And so you have to fully appreciate that it's going to be a roller coaster ride. And I think you need to be very, very committed to the long term. And when I say long term, I'm talking 12 to 18 months, possibly 24 months. And, and understand that it's no, not all going to be plain sailing. I think we have some really frustrating moments within the organisation. We have some um, personalities which come out which are really, really difficult to deal with. And some of them hark back to the core issues we have within the team. What's nice is we've got a whole bunch of tools which we didn't have before to, to deal with these difficult situations and frustrating situations. Um, and it's great to have a language that people, when someone talks um, in a derogatory manner or something that's not collaborative, someone can say, well, you're now below the line. Um, and that's been great um, for the team and for the organisation to have the same language. The other thing I'd recommend is that you go into the process fully understanding that there will be different interpretations of the team members in terms of what does a high-performing team mean. Uh, and for me, a high-performing team is not a harmonious team. It is a team that delivers results. And, uh, and that may be in the, the context of constructive conflict. When, when I look at the team now, we're starting to have constructive conflict. We're having meaningful debates. And I see that as really positive. Uh, and, but, but you need to be prepared for that's what it's going to take, as opposed to us uh, having a, a harmonious life. And I think earlier in, in maybe 2013, we would have just fallen apart. But what we've been able to do is really come together as a, as a management team. And everybody uh, owns their piece of the problem and are really actioning and attacking the piece of the problem which fits into their do into their department. So supply chain obviously is handling their pieces, regulatory has really come up to speed and, and, and owning their pieces and really driving them through. So I think what we're seeing is a faster um, resolution to problems which might have taken you know, two, three times as long before. So yeah, we've got a problem right now, but we're pretty confident that we can turn it around very, very quickly. Um, but I genuinely feel, had we not gone through the Leadership um, Circle program last year, um, I don't feel that we would have been able to get through this last quarter as effectively as we had. Um, because when times got tough in the last few months, we've been able to talk about it, have a discussion in the same room, solve the problem and move on. I think had we gone through this rough time last year, or earlier last year, we wouldn't have been able to have those robust debates. We would have kind of closed up and walked away and had to have closed door meetings. Whereas I think in the past three months, whilst it's been tough, we've really been able to get through it as a team. Um, and I think that's been a great example of how we've moved forward as a team since you know, the end of 2013. I think it's fair to say that they are now a team in terms of the way this, they describe how they come together and how they work on their issues, planned or emergent. So here's where they were in March of 2013. 14, and he's where they were last week in terms of, of their own assessment. So, so clearly have moved, they clearly have evolved and clearly are, are changing and will undoubtedly keep changing as, as Act 2 and Act 3 commences. But when you ask them about you know, what have been the biggest shifts, they always come back to 
well, when we were on the mat in Barwell, here's where we are. Now we're actually having conversations that are up here. And if you look at the second one, we are really clear as a group who we want to be. And we are really clear as a group what we stand for. And we are happy to be judged by that because we've committed to it. Um, so a very, very different type of conversation, a very, very different level of insight. So Act 2 is just about to begin. They've committed to three key things as a starting point. Again, they're very clear on starting. Let's not worry about next year. That's where we're starting. They're looking at they're moving bu um, businesses in terms of offices from Piermount to North Ryde, so the physical change of the whole organization. With that, they know that's going to cause disruption. So Bryony, Alan, and uh, Ian are doing TLC accreditation this month, I think, for them to work with the next level of leaders across the organization to help the next top 20 understand the ethos that they want to use as they move their business into a different area. They're looking at process development, and those 20 leaders are taking charge of that, and looking at um, the whole operating rhythm for the business um, that they want the business to pulse together. So next steps, more on the business side, but very much built upon what they've learned on how to work together. So before I hand over to Alan for the final words of this presentation, I want to acknowledge Alan, Bryony, and Ian for their honesty and for their courage in sharing their journey so far on behalf of their own colleagues. I think we can learn a lot from that level of transparency. I want to acknowledge my own team for the work they've done alongside me and Sandals over the last couple of years. And for anybody who's interested in learning more about leadership teams and working with them, here's a simple download that might be useful for you on our site. Over to Alan Tillak for the following words. So in January, I attended a regional leadership meeting which was held in Asia. And at that meeting, Australia and New Zealand was acknowledged for its performance and acknowledged as the leading country in the region for performance. We're also acknowledged as a leader in collaboration. And I think that is a great reflection of the work that the leadership team has done and, and, and the way that the team has developed and evolved. But the reality here is that we're a work in progress. And we have made significant gains and I'm absolutely delighted with the progress that we've made but I am in no doubt that the fact that we have still a great deal of work to do. So it's fantastic where we've come. I think we're doing a much, much better job leading the business today, but gosh, we've got a lot of work to do. Act two begins. <laughs>